know how many underwater cities there are on Earth? None. Do you know how many underwater research stations there are in the world? One. Do you know how many we used to have? Over 60. What happened? Anyone who's played Bioshock knows Andrew Ryan and the world he dreamed up for us all. If underwater cities are throughout fiction and lore, why hasn't a real Andrew Ryan taken us to the depths? But it's not just Bioshock. There have been underwater colonies in Sequest, Call of Duty Black Ops, Deep Star 6, Sphere, you know I mean? The Abyss, Lost, Deep Blue Sea... <laughs> now I'm not interested in lost cities like Atlantis or the Yonaguni Monument, and I'm not talking about submarines. I'm talking about living at the bottom of the sea. Or to live at the bottom of the earth. I mean, we can free dive over 100 meters and even hunt on the ocean floor. Well, when I say me, I mean, I, have, I haven't done. I say we, I haven't, I'm not. No, I don't need to go away and say it's all Gervais, Refugees Plus, but I don't, I haven't, I've done very little to actually towards the, I've done nothing towards it. The bottom of the sea just seems so attractive. It's so alien, almost as alien as outer space. And it turns out both were explored at the same time. So the 60s and 70s weren't just about the Beatles, flares, and no bras. The first problem with living underwater is the bend. No, the bend. The, the bends, aka decompression sickness. This was documented by construction workers on the Brooklyn Bridge. See, workers were underwater in a caisson, basically a giant hollow box laying the bridge's foundations. Air was pumped into the caisson at a pressure greater than the water outside. Even though it wasn't that deep, the pressure difference at the river floor was enough that, when returning to the surface, the nitrogen in the workers' blood expanded and bubbled and killed them. The exact same thing happened swimming the depths of the ocean and returning to the surface too quickly. Okay, so after we worked that out, what were the first steps towards an underwater colony? The first habitat at the bottom of the sea was the French Continental Shelf Project, or Conchel. In 1962, two men, Albert Falco and Claude Wesley, were the very first aquanauts to live underwater for a week. They're seen here with the man that pioneered the idea of underwater habitats, and the man whose life mission became protecting the ocean, Jacques Cousteau. Conchelf 2 was built one year later, 10 metres below the water surface, on the floor of the Red Sea off Sudan. Look how crazy this shit is from 50 years ago. Dump the starfish, five chaps live for a month in the base. To avoid the bends, this is the very first time an oxygen helium air was used. See, once a diver descends below 130 feet or so, normal air, containing nitrogen and oxygen, becomes harmful to breathe. So swapping nitrogen for helium makes the air breathable under these intense pressures, with no lasting side effects. Oxygen is a corrosive gas. In the same family as fluorine and chlorine. Essentially, that's why we're beating helium down here, because uh, oxygen at any level higher than 2.3 becomes toxic. Well, I'm a yellow brick road. <laughs> now, not once to be outdone by all this French froggery. The US Navy created Sea Lab, and at first tested it in the waters of Bermuda at a depth of 60 meters. The, the house four aquanauts for 11 days, but was abandoned due to an incoming tropical storm. There's a storm coming, Ari. Storm's coming. There's a fucking storm coming, Dad! But Sea Lab paved the way, testing and proving the concept of saturation diving. See, after about 24 hours at any depth, a body becomes saturated with dissolved gas. So once the body is saturated, decompression time, or the time needed to bring a diver gradually back to the surface pressure without decompression sickness, is the same, regardless of how much time they spent underwater. This was followed by Sea Lab 2 in 1965. There were two teams that remained at the sea floor for 15 days, while that man, aquanaut and astronaut Scott Carpenter remained for the entire 30 days. During that time, he spoke by phone with the astronaut Gordon Cooper, who was in the Gemini space capsule orbiting the Earth. During Sea Lab, the divers worked on a mock-up of a submarine hull and tested undersea tools. They raised an old Navy jet fighter to the surface with synthetic foam, they set up a weather station, they mined ore samples, they experimented with plants, they studied ocean floor geology, and even tested an electric dry suit. Yes, science! They also experimented with a dolphin named Tuffy, who delivered them newspapers and soda pop. Sea Lab 3 ended the Sea Lab experiments. One of the divers, Barry Cannon, died due to asphyxiation, and Sea Lab was abandoned at the bottom of the sea. 
In 2002, the US Navy Deep Submergence Unit found and visited the still submerged Sea Lab 3 in its final resting place. Wasting no time, after the Sea Lab disaster, Project Tektite was underway in 1969. The project title, Tektite, is the name of meteorites that survive punching through the Earth's atmosphere and end up at the ocean floor. This is because it was sponsored by various US departments, NASA and General Electric. The idea was that an underwater habitat is a perfect place for astronaut training, as it's similar to space. Below the sea, you're at saturation. You can't just come to the surface. You're in a confined space and you can't just leave when you're fed up. One year later, Project Tektite 2 was conducted by 53 aquanauts in 11 missions lasting up to 20 days, including an all-female team. At the conclusion of Project Tektite, the habitat was returned to the Navy's Philadelphia shipyard where it stayed. A group purchased the habitat from General Electric for one dollar. Is no more than a hundred pennies. As long as they removed it from the GE storage facility. By 1980, the habitat was completely restored by volunteers and recertified by use in deep water. But the allure of exploration and research is waning. Plans to place the habitat in several underwater locations were explored and several underwater education programs proposed, but due to lack of government or corporate funding, the habitat was never submerged again. It once again deteriorated and in 1991 it was disassembled and the metal was sold for scrap. After half a century of exploring the ocean and over 60 underwater habitats once in operation around the world and not a rapture in sight and just when I want to take a wrench to someone's face, is there anything? We still have Aquarius. Aquarius is the only still functioning underwater habitat today. It sits 18 metres below the surface, 4.5 kilometres off Key Largo, Florida. Aquarius is possible because it builds on all the advance made by habitats before. The facility has hosted 117 research missions, produced 300 scientific publications, numerous popular science articles and educational programs. It has also hosted filmmakers, Navy divers and 40 NASA astronauts who train for the working conditions of space stations, zero gravity and mining asteroids. Last year the lab was to shut down due to operating costs. But after backlash from scientists and South Florida political leaders, Aquarius was given a six month lease on life through Florida International University. But no rapture then. With the shrinking of funding and even NASA being cut in half, it looks like underwater cities may forever be a piece of imagination. It is easier, safer and cheaper to send a rover and this is probably where exploration will continue to move. But big, publicly visible and expensive projects are what inspire the next generation of scientists. You can say to a class, hey, you can be a marine biologist. You get to sit in this lab here and you'll get lots of work done in an efficient manner. And all the researchers I know do work like this and they do a lot of good stuff. But what if you could say, hey, you want to be a marine biologist? You could be part of the next phase of human exploration at the bottom of the sea. Living down there with other researchers, exploring the unknown and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. That's what's going to inspire. Not efficiency. Not practicality and you cannot put a dollar price on that. Besides, how else am I going to get my rapture? I'm Robin Ideas, and remember, everything is interesting.